Welcome to Englewood After Dark, Episode 7, From the Ashes. Englewood After Dark is a serialised horror audio drama, and for the best experience, we recommend starting with Episode 1. Content warnings for this episode include discussions of murder and conspiracy talk. Hey, hey, hey there, intrepid mystery lovers, and welcome back to another episode of Englewood After Dark. It's me, your celebrity guest appearance, bad bitch with redeeming qualities. <laughs> and as always, I'm your world-weary B-list host with a crippling gambling problem after my third wife left me. She's my wife now, Evie. Now, for those wondering why Carmen is here, fret not, Finn is perfectly safe and sound, this time. And he'll be joining us shortly. We're going to have a very busy night tonight, so we'll be bringing in our speakers one by one. But Eve thought it would be best to start strong. And, well, that's why I'm here. Yes, Carmen, that's why. What? I'm a fan favourite, Evie. What else can I say? Before we dig into tonight's main course, Carmen, why don't you give us a rundown of everything thus far? You know, since you're a fan fave, you brought a list. Of course you brought a list. This is why we're friends. Always make a list, kids. It gives you a tangible feeling of overcoming obstacles and destroying your enemies. It's just good for the soul. Also, it's easy to copy your notes. You have a full-blown murder board in our room. The only thing missing is a knife sticking out of the board. <laughs> Feel free to contribute yours. <clears throat> in this Anglewood After Dark mystery, Eve and Finn decide to boost their ratings by tackling the lowest hanging fruit of popular speculation. <laughs> True, but hurtful. The farm, as we all know, is supposed to be super haunted. Inhabited by the ghost of a long-dead philosophy professor, Ludwig Schmidt. Schmidt reportedly prowls the grounds armed with his horny bat, sending naughty boys and girls to horny jail. Whereupon he swiftly puts them on horny row and executes them. Mm-hmm. Murder of the first degree. But Anglewood students never let a little death stop them from having fun. Arrête <laughs> en <laughs> Okay, nerd, all right. Back to my list. It's revealed that Schmidt had a change of personality shortly before he started killing. Eve looks for psychological explanations. Finn goes straight to demons. The two of them turn towards two sources of information. The blood-soaked soil by C.J. Briggs and a poster on an ancient message board rumored to date all the way back to the 1990s. Yeah, I remember being naive and optimistic the first times we called Bridges. I had hoped that rational minds would uh, prevail, I guess. Yup. We all saw how that turned out. Turns out that Finn and Bridges are two peas in a crazy pod, and Bridges believes something supernatural is at work. Though, he also pointed to a group of potential accomplices who formed around Schmidt. <laughs> Full marks so far. How about the names? Victim 1, Jessica Green. Disappeared mysteriously after a party. Victim 2, Angela DeLuca, who was the captain of the volleyball team who disappeared on her daily jog. Caused a real shit show when she went missing. And then our third victim, Laura Wilson, who disappeared mid-concert and got everyone really riled up again. After that, we looked at some other disappearances since Schmidt's death. Yumi Nakajima, Katarina Surbich... Oh, I didn't know you two were fighting. Katarina Serbik! I said Serbik. Play the tape. Ah, uh, crap. Fine. <laughs> Katarina Serbik, Yumi Nakajima, and, of course, Samantha Taylor and Amber Reed. But we'll get on to those two shortly. 
CJ Riggs is dead, so Eve and I get some fat loot. Turns out he omitted tons of stuff from his book about accomplices, which is real sus. Anyway, Finn goes missing and we all kind of freak. We get him back and now we're ready to fight. We get our hands on Amber's laptop and poke around, digging up campus's local stonemason fuckboys, the Brotherhood of Oak and Ash. Nice summary. And wow, your handwriting is impossible to read. Whoa, hey, secret medicine technique. Writing an esoteric code that can't be deciphered by outsiders. <laughs> All right, looks like it's about time we get in touch with Finn and Co. You ready? Go for it. Hey there, and welcome to Finn's voicemail. Glad to have you here. I'm afraid I have urgent business to attend to, but please grab a seat, take some snacks, and leave your message at the tone. I'll be out in a... Uh, seriously? God damn it, Finn, you better not have gone abducted again. Sorry, sorry, I had butter on my fingers. Seriously? Well, I'm sorry, Eve, for being hungry. There's a lot going on. First, you can't make it back in time for recording, and now you can't even pull over? Fuck off, I'm rushing to be back by midnight. Oh, gee, it sure sounds like somebody should have tried planning their trip in advance. Gee. It sure sounds like someone should try shutting the fuck up. Okay, okay. Let's switch this back to Finn and I. Finn, I guess you're just coming to us live from the passenger seat now. Seb, thank you for tolerating all of this. I made a deal with Seb, but this favor has cost me dearly. <laughs> Dear listeners, we apologize for Finn's... We apologize for Finn. We considered delaying today's episode for a week, but we have only so many weeks left in the semester, and so the show must go on. Besides, we've had a recent break in our case that Finn is very eager to share with you. But not that case, the other case. I said we'd return to Samantha shortly. And guess who just visited Samantha in the flesh? It was me, me and Seb. We went on a quest for truth and had a road trip. It was awesome. It was exhausting. And I can 100% guarantee she is alive and well, and not even possessed, I think. At the risk of inciting your delusions further, what makes you think she's not possessed? Well, I brought my crystals and- Okay, forget I ever asked. <laughs> Roger that. I had a long talk with Samantha and interviewed her, and I've got some hot gusts to spill. Oh, we'll keep that for the main course then. Hang in there, Finn. You'll get your chance soon. If any of our Oak and Ash friends are listening, feel free to scream, panic, or otherwise start running away. And of course, a final surprise for the night. I know Finn has been itching to share this one, so I'll let him inform you. Yes, our final spectacular surprise for tonight is yet another special guest who will be joining Eve right after our break. Getting crowded tonight, isn't it? But what an exceptional guest he is. A hero of the people, and... It's Samuel, now stop shouting in my damn ear! Jesus, is Seb sitting on the gear stick? Sounds like he's got a... Enough, you two. Please, just don't fight in front of the baby. The baby is Finn, by the way. Let's cut to our break and see if we can all calm down in time for normal human contact, like our guest. <laughs> Today's Englewood mailbox mail comes to us from Zephos219, who writes, oh, Wow, we really need to start proofreading and selecting our mail beforehand. <clears throat> Today's Englewood mail comes from Zephos219, who writes, There is power in a name. Um, and that's it. That's all she wrote. There is power in a name. Listen, Zephos219. I'm not certain if that is supposed to be a threat or a piece of motivational advice, but it sort of fails at both. You have the whole body of the email at your disposal and you're allowed to use it. Just be aware that I will deliver you a scathing rebuttal that carefully straddles the line between witty and mean. Next week, maybe something normal. Welcome back, everyone, and good evening to our guest, Samuel. Right, hello. Thank you for having me. Now, avid conspiracy theorists out there may have pieced together the reasons for Samuel's appearance on the show tonight. 
But for everyone else, here's what's up. Samuel has more to do with everything going on than we first expected. Eagle-eared listeners, Eagle-eared? Eagle-eared listeners may remember us mentioning Sam when we dug into Samantha Taylor's apparent death. Right. Finn went rogue and weird and found Samantha, proving that she wasn't the body recovered in the burnt-down back building. And then Samuel came forward and identified himself as Sam. Right. When I was younger, I went exclusively by Sam. And you knew Samantha, correct? She and I had a class or two together. I saw her mostly when she visited Nathan. They had a spot by the back building. For their illicit love affair. Please ignore him. Finn doesn't know how to people very well sometimes. No, no, it's fine. We asked you to come on the podcast today with the Samuel, not just to clear your own name, but to help us understand what happened all those years ago. (laughs) It wasn't that long ago. Yo, 2002 was the year I was born. Uh, Carmen? Right. Well, I'll help in any way I possibly can. So, since you were there at the time of the copycat murders, do you think you could explain a little bit about what campus felt like? Well, it was a strange time, to be certain. I remember Amber Reed going missing in my first year, I think. Everyone became incredibly paranoid and scared for a time. Especially for female students. There were lots of silly pranks, too. Pranks? Yeah, people stole skeletons, the plastic kind and the real kind, and dressed them up in professor's clothes. And they'd sort of rig them to the backs of doors so they'd drop down on people. Fucking assholes. After a while, with the curfews and some harsh punishment for the pranksters, it died down. But when Katerina died in second year, everything got so much worse. How so? Well, the girl who killed her, I forget her name. Helena? Right, Helena. She lived in the Redwood Dorms. I remember because we all started calling it the Deadwood Dorms. Ugh, original. They even graffitied the signs around campus. Tell me they didn't spell it D-E-D wood. They did. I hate them. She can excuse murder, but draws the line at misspelling. Fuck you too, Seb. Fuck you too, Seb. <clears throat> anyway, Samuel, you were saying? Right. The dorms were experiencing a lot of petty vandalism, destruction of property and the like. Just because Helena lived there. It was a troubling time. Campus was on edge. People were turning against each other. I think everyone just wanted the deaths to stop. And then it seemed like Samantha died. Things were... almost back to normal, you know? Until the back building burned down. It was a fire trap, basically kindling and faulty wiring. It was always going to burn down one day. Administrators just didn't want to fork out the cash to demolish it. Typical. I had a little... allotment out behind the building. I knew everyone who came and went. Samantha and Nathaniel were more frequent visitors, but there were a couple of others, of course. A couple who used to get high. Some of the rich kids on campus used it to do God knows what. Rich kids, huh? Yes, they were the weird ones. Always late at night. Always in a group. Interesting. I suppose even rich kids need a place to get high. And what happened the evening of the fire? We should... Even if those were members of the Brotherhood, they have long since graduated. Maybe they might know who is still in the society. Samuel, after we do this recording, would you mind telling us any names you remember? I think so, but it's been a while. I think I can remember the first names. No worries, Samuel. Everything helps. Okay. Uh, can you tell us what you recall about the evening of the fire? I'll never be able to forget that night. It it ruined me. If you need to take a break for a moment, that's fine. We can... No. It was a long time ago. I'm alright. It was late in October. I was turning over my flower beds. I saw Samantha going into the building. I remember she hadn't been there for a few weeks prior. I remember feeling relieved because it meant she and Nathaniel must have made up. Why were you out so late? I didn't 
have a lot of friends. So I made this bench in my allotment to sit and relax by myself. But after Samantha went back inside, I, I'd headed back to my dorm. I was in Beechwood, so my window overlooked the corner of the back building. I remember getting home and looking outside and seeing the windows of a building lit up in an orange glow. At first I thought it was candles. But then I realized that too many windows were lit up. And then you realized it was a fire. No, you think? Well, one of us has to. <clears throat> Did you call the fire department? I didn't have a phone, so I ran down the corridor shouting, Fire! And I ran back toward the building, but by the time I got there... All right, Samuel, take your time. It's... It's like I said, the building was basically kindling. I got there in time to watch the second floor collapse. So I just ran back to the door and tried to get someone to help. And then the police told you there was a dead body? They asked me a lot of questions about what I'd seen and what I'd heard, and I they told them I saw Samantha go inside. And they just talked to me for hours to iron out the details, but by the time they sent me home, it was too late. Too late? Campus turned on me. Students thought that since I had been questioned, since people had seen me skulking around, that I was guilty. That I had killed Samantha. I'm so sorry, Samuel. It didn't matter that the investigators determined the fire was an accident. The court of public opinion was already certain of my guilt. So I dropped out a month later. I'm just... I'm just glad to have a chance to clear my name. And we're happy to help, Samuel. But this brings us to the most important question. If it wasn't Samantha, who was the body pulled from the back building? Which is why Dumb and Dumber are coming to us live from inside Dumber's car. They went to get Samantha's side of the story. <laughs> oh, he's super hung up on you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, big baby. Hello? Hello, Finn. Can we call a truce? He started, started it. it. Yeah, well, I'm finishing it. We have a guest and a podcast to run. Man, I have got to learn how to do that. So, we looked into other missing persons in the area who disappeared around the time of the fire. I mean, do we have options? People just disappear around here. It's like we're in the Bermuda Triangle. But for what we were looking for, nothing fit. Just an interesting tidbit designed to help you sleep more comfortably. So we had to keep digging. While the girls were looking into this, I had the truly inspired idea of calling Samantha again and explaining to her what was going on. Because Finn still has no concept of stranger danger or personal boundaries. Samantha was upset when she found out what happened to Samuel. She really liked him and wanted to help. Hence the road trip. And since someone can't drive, I got roped into this. All hail kind and benevolent Sebastian, who has gifted onto us his noble steed. Finn. We went to see Samantha, and we asked her about that night. She told us how she left not too long after Samuel did. Nathaniel came to pick her up and insisted on a real date. So we asked her if she had seen anything unusual. Turns out the place had been set up for a spooky party. Apparently there was alcohol, decorations, and candles the whole nine yards. Meanwhile, Carmen and I were trying to figure out who could have been in the building that no one had noticed go missing. We looked into transient populations, but no dice. We tried homeless shelters, but nobody had records that far back, and even then, since the person was on campus, it was highly likely that it was someone from campus. And then, playing off a hunch, I looked into records from the biology department at the time. And guess who lost themselves a skeleton? I'm guessing the biology department, maybe? Huh. Some idiot stole one of the science department's skeletons. But they stole the only skeleton still owned by the university that was actually still a real skeleton. 
Her name was Betty. Apparently, when she was first acquired, she came in a set with another skeleton called Veronica. But it was Betty who had been stolen. And it was Betty who burned in the fire that evening. Exactly. No one died that night. A building collapsed, a romance kindled. But no one got hurt. Except Samuel. You sure? Very. At the time, everyone on campus was certain it was Samantha, right? But the coroner still checked over the bones in case of anything weird. You mean other than the fact that they resembled charcoal briquette? Right. The coroner noted in their report that they were uncertain about the age of the bones, but they did note that the femur of the left leg was shorter than that of the right, estimating that the woman would have walked with a limp. Which Samantha did, but we know she's still alive, and thanks to the records from the biology department, it was easy to ascertain that Betty also had a short left femur. I can't believe that. All these years that I thought... I thought if, if only I hadn't gone home, or if only I, if I'd arrived quicker, if only I'd made... <laughs> Come on, Samuel. Let's get you some tea and leave the others to wrap up the segment, yeah? Thank you. That sounds good. The authorities have been notified of everything we uncovered. Not that Finn was any help with that. What? I'm bad with authority. Right. I'm beginning to think you have some kind of history with Pube Evans that you don't want out there. What? Of course not. I miss you, Tara. Is that Finn Nightingale over there? Sheriff? Well, yeah, I thought that was you. What the heck are you doing in Englewood? I go to school here. Whoa, hold on. You go to school here. It's a free country. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I suppose it is. Is that the uh, tree they planted for her? Yep. Yeah, orange tree, right? I always thought it was fate. Uh, Nicole just loved oranges. Nicole? My daughter. She's been here for two years now. Her mother and I buried her here because your sister's tree, funnily enough. Um, sorry for your loss, Sheriff. Uh, and Finn, I'm, I'm sorry for yours. If you ever need to talk. I, uh, thanks for the offer, Sheriff. Um, but I, I have to go. Um... Class, you know? <sighs> yeah, of course. But, as a follow-up, we did ask Samantha about anyone else who frequented the back building. Turns out, one time she ran into them. She doesn't remember who they were, but she remembered what they were doing because it freaked her out so much. He's real excited about this. They were doing occult stuff. Finn, please. Well, they were. They had symbols written on the floor in chalk and goblets full of ominous liquids and a dang Ouija board. Secret societies are wild. One look at that and Samantha ran. That was the real reason Samuel didn't see her for a while. She was real freaked out. Given the track record that these guys seem to have, she's really lucky. Really, really lucky. I can hear the frenzy in your tone. I think that they were trying to kill Samantha that night and that she only survived by sheer coincidence. And there it is. Finn. Why are you finning me? I'm right! You think they were going to kill her just for seeing them there? What about Samuel? But Samantha is the only person who saw what they were doing. Hear this. Oh, here we fucking go. You're the uber-secret Brotherhood of Oak and Ash. Up to your occult shenanigans in the back building. Summoning old Schmitty for a shindig. As you do. And then Samantha walks into your sausage fest. Sees everything. She runs before you can finish pulling your heads out of your asses long enough to chase her down. You okay there, bud? I'm fine. Anyway, you and your nefarious cronies of douchebagdom decide that you're all too rich to chase someone down. So instead, you make a trap. 
You know all the ins and outs of this building. You know just where to start a fire, and you know that arson is extremely hard to prove. Yeah, clearly he's fine. Uh-huh. Shush. So you wait for Samantha to return, and then you set your trap. The next thing you hear, the building and Samantha are both gone, and you go to sleep in your nefarious beds, proud of your dastardly schemes. We're gonna call back. <sighs> In conclusion, faithful listeners, today we've exonerated a man and found out more about the Brotherhood of Okanesh. But still not enough to figure out exactly what it is they don't want us to find. Unless Finn is right, and they simply don't want us to tie them to arson? But arson is extremely difficult to prove, let alone an arson from more than a decade ago. I know there's something more here. Where are the boys? They'll be right back. How are you doing, Samuel? Better. Thank you. No, thank you. You've helped us out so much already. Without you, we wouldn't even have Amber's laptop. I'm just happy to have helped. Does that mean we're doing the ad read? Yeah, I wish it was a little less awkward given everything we just talked about. Oh, yeah. (sighs) That being said, stick with us through this ad break and we'll be right back with even more theories. Hey there, intrepid mystery lovers. This one goes out to all our listeners here on campus. If you tune in for our show, we know there's a good chance you've got at least a casual interest in horror. Whether you're listening for the true crime aspects, or Finn's supernatural nonsense, have we got just the event for you. The Kappa Phi Sorority House is holding their annual charity fundraiser at Sycamore Hall. All proceeds from admission, food, drinks, etc. will be going towards Beyond Housing, a local charity that provides food, shelter, and needed amenities to those without homes or those with financial trouble. It is a costume party, so if you feel like dressing up this October, this information goes out to all you ghouls, goblins, ghosts, and gorehounds. And heck, maybe I can even convince Finn to break out his costume from when he starred in Cats. So long as you live on campus, all are welcome, and it's all for a good cause, so we hope to see you there. Stay spooky, everyone. So, Finn and Seb, are we back? Yeah, yeah, we're back. Had to force Finn to slow down and breathe, you were talking like a man possessed. I was not- Figuratively, you nutcase. Only a nutcase if I'm wrong. Don't make me pull over this car. Okay, boys, enough of that. We don't have time to get into whatever the heck it is you two are arguing about. Though we're not too much closer to finding out any names of our would-be secret society participants, I'm gonna mark this week as a win. Samuel, we are so grateful to have you as a guest. We know it must have been an emotional roller coaster for you, but do you have anything else you would like to say to our audience before we wrap things up? Well, if you could stop saying all those years ago, I would appreciate that, even if it's true. Really starting to make me feel old. Sorry. It's fine, I'm only half serious. Really. Thank you for giving me a chance to speak. I actually did have one thing to share. I was kind of saving it for the end. I thought it would be a nice cliffhanger for your audience. Oh, we do tend to keep them hanging in one way or another. Oh, I know. You know? Well, not a lot of people talk to me when I'm on campus, whether I'm working or not. So I keep my headphones in all day. Audiobooks, music, podcasts. Oh my god, Eve, we have a fan. Finn, you knew we had fans. You check our listen account at least three times a day. But no one has ever said so to me in person. We're on a phone call, Finn. Still not in person. Well, as I said, I'm one of your intrepid mystery lovers. And I know for the past few weeks you've been trying to find out who snuck into the fine arts building on that day that Finn went missing. And, uh, I happen to have access to the cameras in that building. I thought only campus security had access to that. Mostly campus security, yes. But somebody has to get into the room and clean the floors, so... Heck yeah. Finn, hold on for just one second. Samuel, won't you get in trouble for that? Maybe, but these are dangerous people you're dealing with. They should be stopped. Couldn't agree more. Well, dear listeners, it looks like we're taking a field trip. 
Give us one moment to break out the lav mics and we will see you soon. All right, and we're back. Filming. <sighs> Recording. On location outside the Finer Arts Building and Security Room. We apologize if we're a bit annoyed. Finn made Carmen, Samuel, and me wait for him before opening the door. I hope we aren't taking too much of your time, Samuel. Like I said, it's no trouble at all. Just let me find the right key here. You heard it here, folks. After just two weeks of tireless detective work, we will have the face, nay, the identity of a member of the Brotherhood of Oak and Ash. And it won't stop there. We'll not rest until the rest of them are caught and brought to justice. Of course they heard it here first. No one else is talking about this. Where would they have heard it? Seb, must you always do that? Yeah. Fine. That's fine, Seb. Nothing could ruin this moment for me. And... Gossip. Come on in. Let me just... Huh. Huh? What's... Huh? All of these monitors are off. That's weird. This system is always running. Well, I mean, you could just power it up, no harm, no foul, right? Theoretically, but, uh... Sorry, I hit the power button and it's showing something. I'm not tech savvy, I don't know what this means. Let me take a look. What's the damage, Seb? When was the last time you were in here, Samuel? Last night? Why's that? And everything was working when you were last here, right? Yeah. There was nothing out of the ordinary. Please tell me you can fix it. This computer has absolutely fuck all on it. Like, not even an operating system. I think someone magnetized the hard drive. Just brilliant. Well, that means they had to come back to the building, right? We can try the keycards again, yeah? If they found a way around that the first time, I doubt they'd slip up the second time around. We don't need the key cards. We don't? No, no we don't, because... Nothing. Never mind. Oh, come on. Clearly you had something. No, it was nothing. Let's wrap this up. Uh, that's... a bit abrupt, isn't it? Finn, let's wrap this up so we can all go speak privately about our progress on this case. Okay... Well, apparently that's it for the day, folks. As always, thank you, Professor Hannessy, for letting us use the recording studio and for letting us borrow the lavalier mics on such short notice. So long. Farewell. And remember, no matter how sneaky you think you are, there's always someone watching. What? Come on! You just finished listening to Englewood After Dark, Episode 7, starring Dennis Altman as Finn Nightingale, Hannah Brown as Eve Pemberley, Mars Dizon as Carmen Ferran, CJ McCauley as Seb, A. Rose as Samuel, and Sam Gogoin as Sheriff Pugh Bevins. On a music provided by the talented Athen, an opening music by Nicholas Gasparini. Written and sound designed by Hannah Brown, Dennis Altman, and A. Rose. Find out more on our website at englewoodafterdark.com.